it looks like it's time. I just want to go ahead and, and first of all, make sure that everyone is, is kind of aware of, of the intention of this. I have two different sessions. The session that is Thursday at 11 o'clock will be for people getting started. Um, this session is for people who are interested in contributing, uh, people who may be interested in, in porting their existing Puppet solutions to the common set who are, or who are working in, in, in downstream and upstream. And this is going to be very focused on how do we work better together, um, you know, what things need to be fixed, and, and a hope that, that we can start to say, well, who can be responsible for certain parts of the code base? And it's definitely intended to be a discussion. I do have slides, but they're very, 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 more of, a, of an agenda. So I think that I wanted to start by just asking who's actually using the, the Puppet modules that we've been working on? Several people. Who's using them in production? Several people. A, a few people, anyways. Great. So I, I want to talk first about um, who follows the Puppet OpenStack mailing list? So just so people do know, there, there is a mailing list, and I'm trying to be more transparent um, and give people an opportunity to be involved. Uh, the discussions around the development of things around Folsom and also going towards Gridsley will all happen through this mailing list. And, and honestly, if it doesn't make sense for it to have its own mailing list, if the reality is that it should just happen on the OpenStack mailing list, I am, I'm open to that suggestion. Do, do people think it makes sense to just have all communications around the Puppet stuff on the OpenStack mailing list? Or do you guys think it makes sense to maintain it, its own mailing list? Yeah, and I, I totally agree with that, that maybe if the modules do become part of upstream, which is something we could maybe think about in six to nine months, then it makes more sense. But I think for now, um, it, it makes sense for it to keep its own mailing list. And if people who are monitoring the, the regular mailing list, if you see Puppet-related questions, if you could just help out by directing people to this mailing list, that would be immensely helpful. So I'm going to start a little bit by talking about some of, of the work for Folsom, for Folsom support that I've been working on, uh, which you can find in, in this repository. And the main things I'm going to talk about are, are new features. I've kind of done a, a, a redesign of the way that everything's structured, which I want to talk about a little bit. And also, I have a Vagrant-based development environment that I've been working on. And, and I wanted to at least ask people, you know, what do people think about Vagrant as a way for us to code and have a repository so we can all develop on something very similar. Yeah, and that's exactly my... my Yeah, you have a lot to say, so you can you, you can just hold on to that. Great, thank you. Maybe it needs a little refresh. Does someone actually want to keep notes? Because it'll probably get kind of boring if I'm trying to, unless you guys enjoy watching me uh, make typos. If someone can just get on that, now we have this, this etherpad. It's just etherpad.openstack.org, devops-puppet-upstream. Yeah, you guys are a, almost a computer-free bunch in here. So I just want to start just by giving kind of a high level for people who had familiarity with the Essex code base. 
about the things that are new and, and you know, not surprisingly, they, they correspond directly to the things that are new in OpenStack, which is now there are quantum and, and Cinder modules. And the Cinder module is, is, is pretty well tested and working. The quantum module, honestly, I've verified everything except the L3 component, so the, the DHCP agent, also the um, regular networking agent the, for, for uh, OVS. And I know that, that Cisco also has a, some work that they've done on quantum that I want to take a hard look at, because I know that that's actually pretty, pr pretty well tested. And actually, one, one question to ask, who has their own fork of Puppet modules that they're maintaining? Are these all different forks? Do you mind if we just go around the room and ask and, and have people say what their fork is? Or if, 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 if it's a fork or if it started from scratch and then who they're with? Yeah, I guess ours started from scratch. It was before you, you actually had yours up. Um, so we've kind of kept going. Um, haven't had a chance to look at combining the two yet. Yeah. You're, are, are you with Nectar? Yeah, Nectar. Yeah. Okay. Um, yep. I think we've talked before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically the same situation. Uh, we wrote ours prior to yours being released, uh, but we've actually moved uh, a lot of yours into ours and kind of merged them. Yeah, you guys um, use the, the native types, right? Yeah, that's right. But haven't right. ported the actual manifest yet? Uh, no. Okay. No, just actually wrote a bunch of modules that we're trying to contribute back actually at this point. Um, Good. So well, well one, of the, one of the questions that I have you going for you going forward is some of the design changes that I've made, I'd be interested to know if that, that helps motivate you guys to, to get on or if it's going to make it easier for you guys to, to get on the same set of modules. There were a couple other hands. Yeah, uh, so I'm Eugene Gerpichov from Irantis. So we have uh, forks which uh, at high availability to OpenStack. They're not publicly open yet, but I've been uh, contributing parts of that to Puppet Labs modules. But uh, that's kind of slowed down recently because we just had to deliver it to the customers. But that will uh, continue. Yeah, and we've actually been working closely to, right. to, to go through all those patches and start merging things in. So, so going through the modules, uh, just uh, support, which is, which is fairly rough. Um, it's going to be fairly rough for, for Quantum, but Cinder is basically the same as Nova Volume, so it's not that big of a deal. Uh, the main change that I want to talk about going forward, oh, general purpose modules. Uh, there's now an open vSwitch module, which is actually pretty cool because it has native types and providers for creating ports and, and networks with, uh, what is it, OVS uh, control command line tool. Um, this is probably the biggest change. Uh, for people who are familiar with the old version of the modules, they had native types for managing individual lines of, of Nova config. And I've actually expanded that concept. So now there are native types for every single INI file that's being managed by OpenStack. And the main advantage of this over what had been previously done is that you can override any configuration from TopScope. So there are really two main motivations for making this switch. One is a lot of the files, especially the uh, paste API INI files, are assumed to be related to the version that the package is deploying. So it allows you to automatically assume the defaults from the packages and then have native types just to edit the individual lines that you care about. So it's individual resources that manage individual lines that we care about. And the other advantage is, in the previous version of the OpenStack modules for Essex, there were a lot of pull requests and patches saying, hey, can you add this extra parameter? Hey, can you customize it in this way? But with the native types, and, and I'm happy to show an example of this, you don't have to do that. You can actually customize any configuration file that you want from TopScope. So all of, of the parameterized class interfaces are really just configuration interfaces for reasonable same defaults. But any customization that you want to do, you can do at, at in user space, preferably in a site manifest. And I think that for, for you guys in particular, how much easier does this make you guys to, to get on board? Yeah? That's a lot of the modifications that we made was basically parameterize the holy mess out of everything. Um, uh, the ori original um, manifests were too restrictive for our purposes. We're doing a lot of non-standard things, pathing, you know, all sorts of other things. So the more you can parameterize um, and make configurable, the more, you know, publicly consumable. I just want to show really quick just an example of, of what this looks like, and I think it actually looks... 
it, oh, it's following me good, just making sure. If I can spell. Just to show an example so that people understand what I'm talking about, if we look at an example of, if I switch to my Folsom branch, and we look at an example of one of the manifests, say for configuring the API service, right? It's, it's the, the configuration in interface pretty much remains as it is. We can see, you know, these are the parameters we can use to configure Glance API, but previously I was using concatenation to manage the whole files, but now we just have these individual resources, right? Every line is actually a resource that manages that particular configuration file, line. So just like this file here is specifying the Glance API config lines here, you could do the same thing at top scope. So that you can, so that it's not managing the whole file, so it's not actually restricting what people who are using the modules can do. And I think that's gonna make it a lot easier to maintain going forward, and also a lot easier for people to use and customize. Right, I think one of the biggest complaints for people who had already rolled their own Puppet solutions is it's just not flexible enough. Um, for, for some of the folks who had rolled their own solution, does this make it easier to, to consider this? So just, I mean, it seems way too complicated for what we do. We just need to push out, you know, a config file for Glance. We just have a file that's a template. And I mean, um, I guess we're all Python people and we're our work, so we don't really do mm -hmm. all the Ruby stuff. So I guess we get a little bit intimidated with um, all this custom types and everything. And so, you know, when we all we, need, we know what we need to do, we send a file, you know. So that's kind of, from our point of view, is why I'm a little bit standoffish. I guess so, so, so whenever you say intimidated, you know, is it? I guess once it works, <laughs> yeah, it's it's less intimidating. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I guess it's it's a bit of a step, and we'd have to learn more about Puppet to, you know, go into it more. I mean, you know, so an, an operator who doesn't know anything about Puppet can easily go in and go, okay, I need to. This is the config file. I need to just edit this one line instead of having to know a bit more about Puppet, I guess. So I guess maybe we're, we're you know, I don't know if other people feel this way, but that's that's uh, what we're, how we're kind of going at the moment. I mean, in saying that, I haven't looked in depth at, at how it works, so I'll need to do that more before I could comment more. Cool. On the other hand, I love it. <laughs> um, I recently moved from an SX deployment using the available uh, Puppet Labs OpenStack stuff mm -hmm. uh, to Folsom and being able to bring in the same defaults from the new Folsom uh, paste.ini files would have saved me a lot of work. Okay, so you didn't use this, you... So I didn't use this, I used the, the, the older... Um, just, just curious, how many people knew I was actually working on this refactor? Not me. Yeah, again, back, <laughs> back to the mailing list. Okay, but a few people knew. So I think going back to this, um, probably the main thing that's, that's missing right now, and I'll assume that this is a task for me, is to make sure that all these types support purging, which will actually be fairly easy to do, right? So for some people, you can assume same defaults from packaging for upgrades and just override the stuff you care about. But I think a lot of people, especially people who are using this to actually launch products, would want to have the ability to control every single config file and purge entries that aren't explicitly configured. So that's kind of my to-do, is, is I still need to implement purging, which I haven't quite done yet. So the next thing that I wanted to talk about is, is a shareable development environment, um, which is something that I put together. It's, it's how I'm going to be developing, at least initially. Uh, the main motivation is really rapid development, uh, being able to develop and build out OpenStack environments on your laptop, but also ensuring that as people are collaborating that everyone's actually using the same development environment, right? That we have the same manifest with the same virtual machines, with the same NICs and the same IPs, so at least when we're developing, we can develop fast and, and make assumptions that everyone's developing using the same environment. And this is composed of, of just a few files. Um, the actual development environment is composed of, of these exact files. So it has a puppet file, and, and puppet file is, 
is fairly new. This is Librarian Puppet, which was released by, by Tim Sharp. And the Puppet file gives you a list of all modules that need to be downloaded. Um, this is kind of what I was doing with the other repos.yaml for people who have familiarity with the Essex code. Uh, but basically, this is now a separate product that you can run Librarian Puppet install on the directory. Give me one second. It actually iterates through. Something that looks like this. So, okay. so it looks very familiar with the other YAML, the other repos.yaml. So this supports both the Puppet Forge, which is where stable release code is gonna be, and also GitHub and even branches. On GitHub, you can see some of this stuff is, is a Folsom branch out of my GitHub repo. So given this file, you can just run librarian puppet install and it'll it'll download all these modules either from the Forge or from GitHub. And again, this goes back to recreatable environments, right? It, it's very similar to submodules, but I think this is gonna be a lot easier to maintain than submodules. So if there's a tagged version or whatever that you want always to reference, in other words, we're releasing uh, the ref. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. Yeah, ref can be used, in, in this case, I'm using it to reference branches, but it's really just revisions. So, so anything Git knows about as a revision. Who has experience with Vagrant? Who's, it, is anyone opposed to Vagrant? Okay, then not everyone's used it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Vagrant is, is fantastic, except for one tiny little detail that it only works with VirtualBox which is horrendous. Um, but I will tell people, for people that are just getting started, as terrible as VirtualBox is, Vagrant is so awesome that it makes it worth using. Can anyone else attest to that? <laughs> I, heard, I heard Mitchell say something about that. Yeah, he's, the, for Vagrant, the, he's moving away from trying to keep it tied to VirtualBox, it's supposed to be, um, broken out into, the back end is supposed to be broken out so you can tie it into other uh, VM environments. And I've heard things about VM Fusion, which is actually what I want. Um, but just to show an example of, of kind of what VirtualBox is and in the terms of, of developing and deploying OpenStack environments with Puppet, uh, this is basically models, all of, of the things that I deploy uh, for the case of just a simple two node installation, you really care about this OpenStack controller and a compute one. And here it's just specifying the IP addresses and how much memory they'll get. And the main, the, the main things really to note here are that we're actually creating specific interfaces. So especially when you're using Nova Network, you have to specify your private and your public interface. So with this, I can ensure that I know what the addresses of, of those things are. We can ensure that all the virtual machines created have three interfaces. And of course, the most important part is this, that it's running Puppet three times, which I'm not extremely ecstatic about, by, but it's running first shell provisioning app get update. And it's doing this because there's this weird chicken and egg problem with installing, what is it, uh, software properties, where like you might have to update your repositories before you can install software properties, which you have to do before you can use PPAs. I'd be happy if someone knows how to fix that, if, if, if they fixed it. But the other thing is, first we run Puppet, and Puppet sets up networking in Etsy hosts for all the VMs, and also sets up apps. Uh, the one thing that I'd warn people uh, that want to use this de development environment, by default, it assumes that you have, on the same network, on, on the 172.16.0.1, that you're running Squid Proxy in 3128. And that's something you definitely should do if you're gonna use this kind of deployment environment for testing and iterating on modules, is run a proxy so that you can run the iteration super fast, right? Just download all the packages in your proxy and then the rest of your runs will be super fast. And that's just something to be warned by that this stuff assumes by default that you've done that and you can see in host, which runs first, that it actually does assume, it actually is configuring apps to use a proxy in that 3128 address. And this is another one of the advantages of, of, of using this dev environment is, 
you know, everyone consolidate, figure out the best way to, to do fast iterations on the modules, and then codify those things so we can share them. The question is, do you have any problem detecting proper puppet, puppet runs coming out of Vagrant? You're, you're saying like de determining if the runs are, are fail or pass? Correct. From my understanding right now, Vagrant doesn't know the difference. I think, we I'm not actually sure. We right? had to do some, some wrapping stuff to get CI to even know that it was kind of a, you know, uh, a not a perfect run. That's actually something that I want to get to is talking about CI. Right now, for me, this is a manual test, mm. and I haven't quite integrated this with Tempest yet, which is, which is something I want to get to and something I want to talk about. Um, so the answer is no. I'm mm. actually not quite that far. Yet. Okay. So the last thing, of course, is the site manifest, which specifies the coded information that matches the environment of virtual machines that Vagrant creates. And it has instructions for creating either like a, like a only MySQL, a only Keystone, or only Glance, but for the more general case for creating an OpenStack controller and a compute node, which is here. So the basic idea is that, right, in these node blocks in Puppet, the virtual machines are going to actually, based on the certificate name, wind up using some of these puppet manifests. So, so I guess really just thoughts. Um, does it make sense to, to try to share development environments? Uh, do people, I guess there's still a step of, of getting more people actively contributing to the modules. Um, but does this seem, it's definitely useful to me. Does it seem like something that's useful to other people? I think it would be, it would be great. great. I, I think it's something we definitely need, even if we don't admit it, even if we all like our own little sandboxes. Even if, even if it's just to have some place to go after you finish doing what you do in your sandbox just to make sure it works wherever. And I think as well, even for people that say, well, I actually want to deploy this in my data center, I think this is a reasonable starting place to say, we'll start here make sure it works here before you deploy it in your data center. And then if it fails there, you can say, well, what's different between this environment versus my environment? That, that's what I see it as right now, is that before you even put it into your CI pipeline, before you even get it into a deployment ready state, is to have that first, that first check at the development, at the individual level. My concern would be being too sticky around a particular deployment model, particularly around networking and some of the physical configurations. And so in a lot of our stuff, while we have been doing a lot with the other guys, um, that's what tends to get in the way, is that we make assumptions about what the deployment model is going to be, and then having one environment leads us down to kind of being not stuck in that environment, but surprised when we get there. So my recommendation is that if you have those vagrant definitions to actually build a catalog of um, deployment models. So for example, you defined single interfaces for those things, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of times and a lot of the way we deploy OpenStack, we do it with bonded interfaces, right? So maybe a vagrant model that shows how to validate that the bonded interfaces actually get passed through correctly and interface names show up in the right places in Nova and all that kind of stuff, right? Those kind of issues are what we found in dealing with some of our stuff around parameterizing things, right? That those actions get you in trouble. And I could see, you know, one potential solution for that would be just keep on expanding the, the manifest site.pp and, and keep on expanding the vagrant files to handle those cases, but I'm not sure. I mean, this is kind of leading towards, I'm just talking about a consistent deployment environment that you can use for iterative development. And I think the, the real question is automated testing and in particular automated testing of, we'll call them verified deployment scenarios. And I'm not sure, I would like for it to be the same thing, that, that vagrant is both the iterative, iterative de deployment tool and also the tool that specifies the deployment scenarios for testing, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I'm worried 
about the dev stack problem, right? Arc Nova's great when built and tested with dev stack, but it does great when it looks like dev stack, right? And so we start finding rough edges as we deviate from what dev stack does. And so my concern is by defining a development environment, right, without necessarily providing some catalog method of doing it, we end up validating one path very well that may not be necessarily applicable to how we're actually deploying. And I guess my, my suggestion is to at least build up enough information as we go along of deployment areas where things fail or get fuzzy. Maybe you don't choose to run them all the time, but at least have those available, right? And, and I guess there's, there's kind of two ways that, that I, I can think of immediately to do that. And of course, I'm, I'm really open for feedback. One of those is probably the reality right now, but it's not the best way, which is crowdsource it. You know, people are gonna start here, people are gonna deploy it. I'm gonna take patches, you know, we all work together. And, and the more people that work on it, the more solid it is for, for more use cases. Um, the real answer is probably codifying more use cases um, which I think is, uh, I would file that for now under dot, dot, dot. Um. Yeah, and that's actually interesting because I could, in, in physical infrastructure, I could get away with two interfaces, but because of the way networking works in Vagrant, I have to have three. Or I guess more specifically, VirtualBox. Yeah, and, there, and there's no question that, you know, if, if one of the things that people decide is, hey, what we need is a vagrant file that imports other vagrant files based on, you know, some piece of information, then, then that's reasonable. I'd, I'd actually be happy to say, you know, there can be a number of vagrant files, you know, that support various people's use cases. Um, no, I, just, I just wanted to mention that I kind of ran into the same thing earlier this year where I set up a complete environment through, uh, through Vagrant and through VirtualBox and when I went ahead and deployed it on the actual hardware that I was deploying on, I spent about two or three weeks just modifying and tweaking it just because of those differences. But uh, what I ended up finding and I ended up pushing back changes was that um, the, t the changes that I did push back, the two environments are now basically able to be deployed by the same manifest. So I, I think I think a deployment catalog is a bit too restrictive. I think the whole point of Puppet would be to to take into account the differences in environments and things like that. And um, even though it would take a lot of work, it might be a lot of uh, other cases. But I think um, I think just generalizing everything enough so that it is deployable across uh, a large range of environments would be the the best and or the more attainable goal. I think. Oh yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, it's alright. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, right, so so in terms of networking being a problem with, uh, uh, the networking really wouldn't be a problem with Puppet then, would it? Well, that's the point, so is something's got to do it. Um, and if Vagrant has a hard-coded method of those IPs and interfaces in it, you will end up needing a catalog of Vagrant files, not manifests. So that's very different. Like our manifests work fine in Vagrant, fine on hardware. They work for both. It's the same same manifests. But the Vagrant file itself, which is just a single text file that he showed you, which kind of defines the interfaces and everything, very likely will need a series of those. Some people will want, you know, different network configuration than another. That's outside of Puppet scope, and it happens as part of the operating system creation. So that kind of has to happen in that Vagrant file, and th that the use for a catalog would be very, you so know. One of the things related to that that I've, you know, we have kind of a, a play vagrant environment that does everything uh, using Razor, but adding bare metal provisioning adds some extra orchestration uh, uh, 
makes things a little bit more complicated in terms of orchestration, especially data lookup orchestration, um, which I actually have branches and stuff that solve that uh, using PuppetDB. Uh, but just for an FYI, like this stuff, I am hopefully getting kit soon, and I'll actually have hardware. So something similar will be running, you know, on hardware, booting everything from scratch, and it'll be tied to, you know, wh whatever changes come in. And that's that's something that I'm hoping to have done winter, <laughs> sometime in winter, because uh, I'll actually get I'm actually getting gear fairly soon. So that'll be different kind of tests, you know, this for development and then something that's actually doing everything pr from provisioning to setting up network. Um, I'm not sure, I would like for those things to be as similar as possible, but it's possible that the Vagrant file gets replaced by something else and, and maybe that something is, you know, we have puppet, mo puppet resources that model Razor deployments or maybe puppet resources that model networking, but then you get into the question of, well, what networks does it work on, what gear does it work on? And, and if, if people have, have more questions about this, we can go back, but, but I at least want to kind of start to go through um, what are the things that need to be done, and, and I'll leave this pretty open in terms of, you know, what do people think is missing? Um, I want to start with some of my things, and I know, yeah, honestly, Folsom support, which is also going to be, it's, it's a refactor, which is going to be the same as, as Grizzly support going forward. Um, I've tested and, and validated it on, on just Ubuntu Precise. Uh, I know that, that Joe has also validated it in, in, in his environment, but honestly, for people that want to get started, for the non-ESIC stuff, for the, for the new design Folsom, that's kind of it. So I think really what I need is people that can bang against it. I know also Derek has started looking at it for Red Hat, but you ran into Fedora 193 issues. I don't know if you saw, but I actually changed that code. There is certain Puppet syntax which is now incompatible with Ruby 193. Uh, in the latest version in the Folsom branch of Nova, that's actually fixed. It's, it's, it's been changed to not use that syntax. Um, but that's definitely what we need now is, is, is people to bang on it, see if it, if it meets their, their requirements. And I'm, I'm pretty happy to change things fairly fast now since it's basically a new code base. And, and I think now is a great time to get ideas in, get code in, uh, but definitely I, I do need more validation on the newer stuff as well. Um, I'd like to do some consolidation on, on HA and, and monitoring modules. And I feel like I can point to various people who have their own HA modules that are built on top of this stuff also have their own monitoring mod modules. And I guess I just wanted to talk to maybe people that, that have those things and, and see if anyone is, is interested in, in contributing or, or, or merging that stuff into core. And I know that I, I've worked with at least a few people on that. Um, I know maybe for, for monitoring, what, what tool do people prefer for, for monitoring? Is everyone using Collecti and, and Nagios? I know you guys aren't. Nagios, Nagios, whatever. Uh, who has their own puppet-based monitoring solutions for OpenStack? Okay, only the ones I know about. Oh no, and, and Nexo. Um, if people are interested, I think that's a, that's a great way to contribute is, you know, first of all, maybe on the mailing list, so let's figure out where those things go. I'm assuming that a monitoring solution should be part of the, of the actual Puppet Labs-OpenStack module. Um, and I think out of everything that I've seen, it seems like, Joe, yours is probably most compatible because I know that you're testing it with the same, based on the same solution. Right. Yeah. And I know that, that for HA, there's actually two things out there. One, there is a, a, a DRBD-based um, solution, which is for active-passive failover of, of control nodes. Um, and I know, know a few folks are, are, are looking at that and, and improving that. But I think that for HA, um, there is a, a kind of multi-host HA mode that it looks like required patches into actual OpenStack that'll be in Grizzly. Um, and I think from my perspective, I would probably just as soon see you know, that HA model go forward and, and, and be the standard. Any, anyone have ideas or questions or concerns around HA and monitoring mod modules? Oh, so this, I already said this is me adding support to, to INI files. I'll do that. I, I just got to sit and do it, right? right? Right now you can create and manage things, but you can't say only the things that I manage should be there and everything else should be removed from the file. Uh, that's just something I need to do in Ruby, which I'll do for all the native types. Uh, I'm going to talk about testing a little bit. 
Um, we, we talked a lot about, about Vagrant for building out environments. Um, I'm going to be looking into basically what makes sense in terms of continuous integration. Um, looks like none of the OpenStack testing people are actually here. But I'll be talking to Monty to see what they're doing. Um, I'm also curious what, what, what the Crowbar team is doing for that to see if anything there is, is, is reusable, especially in terms of um, defining deployment scenarios or, or, or a catalog, as you called it. Uh, who actually has their own continuous integration environment that's, that's built on Puppet-based deployment? Interesting. You guys are using Smokestack? I know that, that, that Soren's been working on, on Puppet-based OpenStack deployments with Tempest running, and that's definitely what I'll be targeting. And, and whatever we put together, you know, right now we have um, unit test results which are published, uh, but hopefully in the next few months we'll also have a full continuous integration test with Tempest that'll be published soon as well. And I'd be happy if, if anyone wants to volunteer to, to help out with that process or has a vision for all the pieces that are involved with that. Um, I, I could definitely use help on it. And the last thing that I want to talk about, which is kind of the, the title of this really, is how do we go upstream? Do, does it make sense for them to go upstream? Uh, what are the barriers for, for going upstream? And I, I think I would definitely like to see the modules go upstream, but I've, I've been talking to, to various people here, and there's some concern that right now the, the development process around OpenStack actually is not really based on packages, and, and everything that I've done so far is really based on packages. So I'm not sure, maybe the first question is, do the Puppet manifest have to support source installation in order to actually be part of OpenStack core? Should they be? Should they be installing from source? Or, or should they even be part of OpenStack core? Or, or, or maybe some kind of, um, what is it, smokestack style, you know, post gate testing. Yeah, in general, um, we kind of, just as a company, have a policy, nothing goes from source. It's just a bad idea <laughs> if you wanted to roll to production kit. Um, if it's not packaged, we'll make packages for it so it's reproducible. Um, without that kind of packaging reproducibility and guarantee that it's 100% stagnant and reproducible, it's, you know, introducing who knows what. And I think the, the other question... And I, and I think from my perspective, it seems like the main motivation for upstreaming would be if developers would actually be interested in, in using something like this for setting up development environments. Do we have OpenStack developers in the room? Maybe that answers the question. <laughs> I would definitely like to live as close to the project as possible. Um, and, and, and that's definitely one of the things that I'm doing while I'm here this week is better understanding what are people's requirements, what are the barriers for that, um, and at least what steps can we take to just be as closely aligned with, with the process as possible. One thing that came out of the uh, Quantum Tempest uh, dev meeting upstairs uh, in the last session was uh, an open question. Um, how, do we do, how do we test uh, Quantum, a networking service, in a distributed environment um, using existing tool sets? So, you know, I, I can't answer the uh, very specific question, any of the core developers want this, um, but uh, some of the stated goals for Tempest uh, may require it. Interesting. And I'm not a developer, but I work with developers all day, software development lifecycle. I'm a project manager, in case you couldn't tell. And, um, and whether or not a developer necessarily wants it, I really think it's the way we need to go just to take away some of the pain that we have when you're working in a group, in a product, Distributed teams, you put your code out there and you got no idea what it's going to do once it comes back down. 
and it just makes it, I see this as making it easier for us to, to have that extra level of confidence. Interesting. I can, I can continue to reach out and, and, and maybe just get a better understanding of, of what the requirements are. And, and actually, I had a question for the, for the crowbar guys. And I, I know that, that one of the sessions was about um, installing from source. And is that, is that tied into a motivation of, of being part of, of OpenStack? So some of the things you might want to consider was one, yes, you do want to pull from source because otherwise you're going to have this whole, which packages do I use? When are they going to be available? So if you want to get closer to the QA for Quantum or Tempest, then you need to be able to do that from source. There will not be packages. Just I, I actually found though that, that, the, that, I mean, Canonical, for example, their testing packages are, are pretty darn close to are source. Are they available for Grizzly? Sorry? Are they available for Grizzly? That's my point. <laughs> the other part that you might want to consider is that you might want to uh, rethink your approach for the uh, paste API and the conf files because that's one of the motivations that the crowbar folks, me included, have gone for to pull from source where all of a sudden you have new config directives that didn't exist before. If you're relying on the package folks to create a basis for you to modify, that's not going to be available when you go to the next to whatever, to G plus one. Chops, put the, the mic over there. Chops, quick, throw the mic <laughs> Throw it. <laughs> oh no, you don't want me to throw something. I, I, can, see, I, can, see, uh, I can see it being valid for both cases. Um, there's, uh, if, you, if you wanted to go upstream, then you could create uh, puppet support that pretty much um, mirrors uh, dev stack. Uh, in which case you would be pulling from source. Uh, but then it, it, uh, it's just exactly what he said where there could be new configuration directives that, uh, that aren't known or are only known to the developers um, that aren't, you know, uh, aren't added to the, uh, the puppet manifest yet. And I think the advantage though is that if you're, if you're deploying everything from source, then in theory the puppet modules could be part of the gating process, so those changes could never even get in. Right, right, and they would be more apparent because, of course, the builds would fail then if you're if you're pulling from source. Um, but in a production environment, then yeah, building from source is probably a, a huge bad idea. Yeah, I was just about to say the same thing. Two very different use cases. You know, for development, you don't want to be packaging. It's a nightmare, right? Um, if you're looking at you know developing for Grizzly and testing for stuff like that, uh, you really the pull from source is very very useful. But um, but yeah, again, you go into production, it's a whole different story, right? So. Um, do the manifest support both development and production? And well, probably they should. Yeah. So, I, I think if they, um, I think if they, uh, the manifest uh, stably supported both uh, Debian and Red Hat, then it would only be like another step just to support source from that. And it's it's just all on the back end, really. Well, it, it's a little more. So, a couple of many different points. So, one of the things in order to be part of the QA process to that's. Um, gate to conf, you don't want to introduce new steps into the development cycle. So you might want to look at uh, things we did is basically go and figure out dependencies out of existing code, uh, out of the existing resources within OpenStack. Mm -hmm. So pip requires apps, whatever is there. Uh, around the deployment and production from source. Source doesn't mean the wild webs. And actually, even if you have packages for OpenStack proper, if you start looking at repos and Python modules and all the other f fun things out there, you need to snap up a big chunk of the internet to actually get a reproducible deployment environment. And so our approach is actually to go and create an ISO, create a, an archive that includes all the dependencies out there. And guess what? The fact that OpenStack components happen to be there in the form of a snapshot of Git repo and on the nodes themselves we deploy from source that we can later update based on production features, that's fine. So we're over? Yeah. So yeah, thanks close. everyone.